All right, everyone, we're going to get started. I'm really excited for y'all to be here today. Um, first, I am going to invite our interpreter, Vita, to kind of go over what her process is. So give me one second, Vita. Sorry. There we go. Take it away, Vita. Hello, I am Vita Rivera. My company, Rosa Rosa, provides interpretation and translation for frontline farming in Spanish and English. I will interpret everything simultaneously and keep as faithful to your words as possible. It's important that you speak clearly and evenly and do not rush. Uh, please also pause in between speakers and try to not interrupt others so I can provide clear interpretation. After my introduction, we will turn on the translation option on Zoom. You will see a globe icon and will be given the option to participate in this meeting in Spanish or English. Please select the language of your heart and ask for help using chat if you are having trouble. And I just wanted to also uh, add, if, if you're gonna speak Spanish or English, when you're speaking, stick to one language because if you mix it, sometimes it, it makes it a little difficult to translate at the same time. Um, hola, yo soy Vida, mi compañía es Rosa Roja y provee la interpretación y la traducción de documentos para frontline farming en el español y el inglés. Yo estaré interpretando todo en el modo de interpretación simultánea y me encargaré de acatarme lo más cercano y fielmente a su significado original posible. Es muy importante que hables de una manera clara y lo más precisa posible y que no te sientas muy deprisa. Favor de tomar pausa entre los presentadores y los discursantes y que no intentes interrumpir a los demás para que pueda brindarles una interpretación que sea muy clara y precisa. Después de mi presentación, prenderemos la opción de traducción e interpretación de Zoom. Verás un icono de globo y tendrás la opción de participar en la reunión en el español o en el inglés. Favor de elegir el idioma de su corazón y favor de pedir apoyo o ayuda a través del chat si tienes cualquier dificultad. Gracias. All right, let's get started. Really appreciate you, Vita. Um, yeah, Casey, if you want to go on and start sharing. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Wise. I am the food access manager with Frontline Farming. I'm going to be facilitating today. We're really excited to have you here. Um, Today, we're gonna to be talking about how you as a farmer can sign up for SNAP and, and start being able to offer that. Um, yeah, it's, it's very detailed, but we have incredible speakers with us today to kind of guide you through that. Um, and hopefully, you know, any questions that you have, we can start, um, we, we, we can answer those for you. So do you wanna to go to that next slide, Casey? Um, so first up, we're going to have Sarah Mitchell from the Colorado Department of Human Services. She's the EPT super, supervisor. Then we're going to have Whitney Butler, a regional rep from MarketLink. Then we're going to have Lonnie Bird, the Double Up Food Bucks Manager with Nourish Colorado. And then we're going to finish up with Casey Neese, our data activist and system manager, ma manager with Frontline Farming. And then I'm going to also talk. Can you go to that next slide, Casey? So basically what we're talking about is food security with SNAP. Um, yeah, we really wanna make sure that you guys understand that, you know, this is not meant to end hunger, but we, we want to make sure that our communities are being fed. So it always gets me hyped up. I could spend a lot of time on this, but I'm not going to. Uh, and I'll kind of just share a few quotes that I thought were, were pretty impactful and then we'll get going. Next slide for me, Case. So the first quote we have is food sovereignty is the right of the peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods 
in their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. It put, puts the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute, and consume food at the heart of the food systems and policies rather than demands of markets and corporations. So this is a de declaration of Nilani, the first global forum on food sovereignty in Mali in 2007. And then the next one is another quote that I thought was pretty powerful. The concept of indigenous food sovereignty is not focused only on land, food, and the ability to control on the, on the rights to land, food, and the ability to control our production system, but also the responsibilities to and culturally, ecologically, and spiritually appropriate relationships with elements of those systems. This concept entails emphasizing reciprocal relationships with aspects of the landscape and the entities on it, rather than asserting rights over particular resources as a means of controlling production and access. And this comes from the book, Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the United States, Restoring Cultural Knowledge, Protecting Environments and Regaining Health, edited by Devin A. Mishua and Elizabeth Hoover. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna go on and jump right into it first with Sarah Mitchell. So Casey, if you could stop sharing yours and Sarah take it away. Thank you very much. I'll be also, excuse me, I'll also be, um, if you have any questions during uh, the presentation, I'll be monitoring our chat and there's going to be five minutes at the end of each presenter where they can answer some of your questions and then we'll have more time at the very end also to answer questions. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, I greatly appreciate being invited to present to you all today. My name is Sarah Mitchell. I am the EBT supervisor with the Colorado Department of Human Services. I've been with the state for nine years, six of which has been in the EBT program. Um, and so I'm going to jump right in to my presentation. So let's start out with what is SNAP? SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps, and it provides nutrition benefits to supplement the food budget of needy families um, so they can produce healthy food and move towards self-sufficiency. SNAP is administered by the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, Food and Nutrition Services. FNS authorizes qualified retailers, including farmers and farmers markets, to accept SNAP. They also monitor SNAP certified retailers to ensure they are following program rules. Local County Department of Human Services certify households to receive SNAP and issue the monthly allotment to uh, eligible households via the EBT card. And then the Colorado Department of Human Services, my employer, oversees the local county offices and ensures they are following program rules. What can SNAP buy? Basically, SNAP can buy any eligible food item to feed households such as fruits and vegetables, meat, poultry, and fish, dairy products, breads and cereals, other foods such as snack foods and non-alcoholic beverages, and seeds and plants which produce food for the household to eat. Households cannot use SNAP benefits to buy vitamins, supplements, prepared food for immediate consumption, hot foods, paper goods, pet food, et cetera. So how to apply to accept SNAP? In order to accept SNAP EBT payments, you must first be approved by FNS. Once approved, you will be a SNAP authorized retailer. So step one, before you start your application, you'll need to register for a USDA e-authentication account in order to obtain access to the online application. Step two, you're going to complete the online application. After starting an online application, you have 30 days to complete and submit your application. If your application is not submitted within 30 days, it will be deleted. 
Before starting your online application, make sure that you have the documents and information needed to apply, which we'll go over in the next few slides. So first I wanna kind of define a direct marketing farmer is an individual producer that sells their own agricultural products directly to the general public. A direct market farmer is able to move locations and a farmer or producer will complete the store application. Next um, is the definition of farmer's market. So a farmer's market is defined as two or more producers that sell their own agricultural products directly to the general public at a fixed location. A farmer's market will complete the farmer's market application. So the next step three, your application is not complete until you submit the required supporting documents. Instructions for submitting your documentation are provided at the end of the online application. Step four, after you submit your supporting documents to FNS, you can check the status of your application in real time. FNS has 45 days to process an application and will contact you if they need any further information. If you have any additional questions, you can call the SNAP Retailer Service Center directly. And as a reminder, start early as the whole process can take one to three months. Once approved, you'll receive a SNAP permit and a seven digit FNS number. FNS uses this number to identify your farmer market and you as the owner or responsible official. Keep this number safe and private You'll need this information in order to obtain EBT equipment. Direct market farmers and farmers markets are considered an exempt retailer. As an exempt retailer, you are eligible to receive no cost EBT equipment. SNS will automatically notify Colorado's EBT vendor, which is FIS, through what is called a ready file. The ready file is also available to other third-party processors. So you could be contact, um, so they could be in contact with you to sell their equipment to newly authorized retailers. SIS will usually reach out to me when they receive notification of a newly approved farmer or market to determine if Colorado um, will be supporting them with no cost EBT equipment. So once FIS notifies me, I will reach out to um, the responsible official to discuss um, EBT options. So before you begin the online application um, to become a SNAP certified retailer, it is recommended that you gather required documents and information that you'll need. So some of the things that you're gonna need is the date the market opened under the current ownership or intended opening date if you are a newly um, new market. Market official name, the mailing address, and the physical address where the market is gonna be located. Actual retail sales data from your market, most recent IRS tax return, if it has been under the current ownership longer than a year. And then um, the market's operating schedule, Fiscal sponsor, um, market ownership, the organization sponsoring the SNAP program. And then only the responsible official can complete official business related to accepting SNAP at your farmer market. In addition to the documentation just covered, you'll need to identify a responsible official. The responsible official um, is responsible for making sure the market follows SNAP program regulations, including training of market staff and vendors on what is SNAP eligible. This is the only person the USDA FNS will speak to regarding your SNAP application or permit, and the only person able to obtain EBT equipment from the state. Um, needs to be an owner, corporate officer, or board member with authority to sign legal documents on behalf of the fiscal sponsor. And you can have multiple responsible officials. Changing this person can be difficult, so it is important it's someone with some sort of permanency within the organization. 
And then um, lastly, the certification and signature statement. You must print, sign, and return the statement. The statement must be signed by the official response or by the responsible official. So a couple things about maintaining SNAP authorization. It is a best practice to save copies of your SNAP application. Obviously, you're going to want to keep um, a hold of that SNAP permit and then any correspondences with the USD FNS, USDA FNS. Your SNAP permit is valid for approximately five years. The USDA FNS will contact you by email and postal mail to reauthorize. You must respond to that letter by the deadline or they will deactivate your SNAP permit. So you are going to want to keep this information up to date and check it on a regular basis. It is also um, important that you process a SNAP sale at least one time a year. If more than a year passes without a sale, the USDA FNS may send you a non-redeemer email and letter. You must call the SNAP Retailer Service Center to reactivate your SNAP permit and keep it active. Um, if you have any questions regarding your SNAP permit, you'll want to reach out directly to the USDA FNS Retail Service Center. So next, I want to talk about um, obtaining equipment to process SNAP EBT benefits. EBT is an electronic system that allows SNAP participants to pay for food using SNAP benefits just like a debit or credit card. When a participant shops at a SNAP authorized retailer, their SNAP EBT account is debited to reimburse the store for the food that was purchased, and then the store's bank account is credited, usually within two banking days. In addition to SNAP benefits, the Colorado EBT program processes cash payments to the EBT card, such as uh, Colorado Works or also known as TANF Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. So the EBT cardholder may have an available balance for food, cash, or both. As I mentioned earlier, direct market farmers and farmers markets are classified as an exempt retailer through FNS. And as an exempt retailer, the state of Colorado is required to provide no-cost EBT equipment. Currently, Colorado has limited state funding to support farmers and markets with wireless equipment and unlimited funding to provide wired point of sale devices. I'm super excited to announce that in July of 2023, CDH, CDHS, my employer, should have secured additional funding to provide no cost wireless devices to all SNAP certified farmers markets and direct market farmers. I totally get it and understand that wired devices is um, doesn't work with farmers and markets. Um, generally, you're out in the field in parking lot, um, out on the corner in a farm stand, and don't have connection to wired devices. So super excited that we have secured this additional funding that should be available this coming summer for us to just provide wireless to all markets and farmers that are in need of equipment. Um, FNS, the USDA FNS currently has a grant opportunity to provide a SNAP mobile app option through MarketLink. Whitney Butler, the regional representative with MarketLink will be presenting this evening and provide you with more information about the services that MarketLink has to offer. And then the store market farmer could also secure equipment to process electronic payments through a third party processor or TPP to accept debit, credit, and or EBT, uh, the market would be responsible for, um, for the cost of um, securing equipment through a third party processor. So basically you have three options to secure EBT equipment. Option one is through the state of Colorado. The next option is through market link which again is a grant program through FNS and Whitney is going to be providing you more information on that option. And then lastly, you can locate and obtain your own equipment through a third party processor. Uh, with the last option, you are responsible for all costs.
Um, sorry, that should have been removed. I apologize. So um, for Colorado supported no cost EBT equipment, you'll need to contact me to determine what options Colorado has available and what option would work best for you. So the first option is a wired option. Colorado will, will release Sorry, will lease one wired EBT only device. Colorado will cover the cost of the lease and all ongoing monthly transaction fees. This option does require a dial up or Ethernet connection. The wired device could be located at the farmer market or off site at another location. If the wired device is located off site, the farmer or market would complete a paper or manual voucher and then redeem the voucher on the wired device within the next couple of days. And there is a handout available on the additional resource slide um, at the end of, the, of my presentation for more information on processing a manual voucher. So the next option is the wireless option. Um, Colorado will lease one wireless EBT only point of sale device. Colorado will cover the cost of the lease and all ongoing monthly transaction fees. This wireless option only works with AT&T cellular service. You don't need to have an AT&T plan. There just needs to be an AT&T tower in the area. Um, this device will only process EBT transactions. It will not process debit or credit. FIS is Colorado's EBT vendor that processes our EBT transactions. They are also the vendor that will provide the point of sale equipment. If you choose either of these options, once I notify FIS that Colorado is supporting your farmer market, someone from FIS will email you with instructions. You will be required to sign a contract and provide banking information so FIS can set up your account to start EBT processing. EBT systems have an end of day processing time when all transactions for the day are totaled and then the transfer of funds begin. Payments are usually deposited in your bank account within two banking days after the system's end of day processing. My contact information will be provided at the end of the presentation. Um, and as mentioned earlier, right now today, Colorado currently has um, limited funding for the wireless. I do have a couple um, lots available or a couple um, devices available, but super excited that come this summer, um, I'll be able to offer wireless to all that um, are in need. So once you're approved to accept SNAP, you can start taking payments at your market. Here's how to take a payment on a point of sale device. You and your employees should follow these general steps for a successful SNAP purchase. So step one, if you do not have an electronic cash register and scanning system, you're gonna wanna separate the SNAP eligible food from ineligible items. Next, you're going to total the food purchases. Step three, you're going to have the SNAP customer swipe his or her EBT card through the point of sale device. You're going to then enter the total food purchase amount into the point of sale device. The SNAP EBT customer will enter their PIN and press the enter key. Only the EBT card holder is allowed to do this. When a PIN is used for a SNAP EBT purchase, you don't need a customer signature and no other identification is needed. If there are sufficient funds and the PIN is entered correctly, an approved message will appear and a receipt is printed. If there is not sufficient funds, the transaction will be denied. In these situations, the SNAP customer may use another form of payment. You're going to give the receipt to the SNAP EBT customer that shows the purchase amount and the balance in the customer's SNAP account. Manually keyed transactions. So when the EBT card is swiped through the point of sale device, the device will re 
will read the account information from the magnetic strip on the back of the card. If that magnetic strip is damaged, it won't be read um, by the point of sale device. If this happens, you may use the um, point of sale keys to enter the card number, but don't manually enter an EBT card unless the SNAP customer and the EBT card is present. Paper EBT vouchers. As mentioned previously, if the farmer market doesn't have a point of sale device on site or the point of sale device stops working, you can use a paper voucher to complete a SNAP transaction. You can get paper vouchers from the provider of your point of sale device. Whenever you complete a paper voucher, ask the customer to sign it. The signature takes place of the PIN entry. You should call the pro your processor for approval while the customer is present. If you call the processor after the customer leaves and there aren't enough funds in the customer SNAP account, you won't get paid. You must electronically clear a voucher using the point of sale device or send the voucher to your processor within a certain amount of time. So next I wanna talk about some tips and best practices. So you can visit the USDA FNS Farmer Producer FNS website for more information. The link will be provided um, in the slides that you'll get after the presentation. Know your FNS number and keep your SNAP permit in a safe place. Know who the FNS responsible official is, and you'll need to notify FNS of any changes to the responsible official. Know how the farm or market obtained EBT equipment and when. Your EBT equipment should have a sticker on it that will um, let you know who to contact with any questions or any troubleshooting with the equipment. Plan for market manager transition. If the market manager is the responsible official, they'll need to contact FNS and the EBT vendor, your third party processor, a new SNAP permit application may be required by the new responsible official. And ensure all appropriate paperwork is turned over with the position. And then uh, be prepared for the new market season. You're gonna wanna keep all FNS and EBT records in a safe place. This could include permit, um, the permit, the SNAP permit, contracts, training materials, documents, et cetera. As a SNAP retailer, you are legally responsible for your actions and the actions of everyone who works in your store, whether they are paid or not. Breaking program rules could result in losing your SNAP permit, being fined, or criminal prosecution. FNS will send a letter notifying the store or market owner when a reauthorization is due. Again, that's approximately every five years. They will notify you via email and through um, postal mail. And then FNS can also conduct periodic reauthor reauthorizations and failure, failure to cooperate with reauthorization will result in losing the ability to accept SNAP. USDA FNS um, important reminder. So your SNAP permit is valid only for the location and owner on record with the USDA FNS. The location and owners are recorded um, on record are listed on your SNAP permit. You are violating the rules and subject to penalty if you accept SNAP at a location that has not been SNAP authorized. If you allow a new owner to use your SNAP permit and or allow other locations or owners to accept SNAP under your SNAP permit. If you have a new location or new owner, you may need to file an application. And if you have any questions or need to report changes, you'll need to reach out to the USDA, FNS, um, and there's some information available on the slide for you. And then, um, this slide here has some additional resources. These are all links to additional documents. So the checklist and FAQs for farmer's market, there is a document for manual vouchers, some information on community supported agriculture or CSAs, 
SNAP EBT vendor tips for farms. And then again, as I mentioned, you can always visit the Farmer Producer FNS website for more information. And they also have SNAP retailer training materials available. And then um, there's also a SNAP EBT PPP, which is the third party processor information for retailers. So it's just gonna give you some information on locating a third party processor for processing the payment. Um, some contact information. So here's some information for myself. Um, you can contact me via email or um, through my direct office number. And then also some information for contacting the FNS USDA SNAP Retailer Service Center. So this page is gonna um, be really helpful for you to um, access some really beneficial resources. And then that ends my presentation for today. So I'd like to open it up if anyone has any questions for me. Yeah, any participants, if you wanna either go on and raise your hand and I'll try and find you and, and let you ask your question or if you wanna put it in the chat. Um, I know we had a few questions for you, Sarah, maybe to get it started. Um, why does the USDA and federal government need personal information like a social security number for the application? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so again, you as like the responsible official um, accepting the payments are responsible um, for the permit and following the regulations. And then part of it is also for um, monitoring and for um, tax purposes, from my understanding. And again, um, from the USDA FNS perspective, they're looking for um, you know, that person who is taking ownership of the SNAP permit and making sure that they're following the rules and regulations of the program. Um. Josh, I can ask one. Yeah, please. If that's okay. Um, so Sarah, can I just get clarification? Because there is an application for a a farm market and a, like a storefront or like farm stand application. And those are two different applications. My question is for someone who is direct to consumer and not like a farmer's market, um, if you have two farm stands, but it's run through the same farm, or if you do a pop-up farm stand, you do need a new FNS for that location, correct? Whitney, if you can help me out if I speak incorrectly, because I know this is probably, you've got way more expertise. From my understanding as the direct market farmer, so as a farmer, you do have the ability to move locations. And so you can have different locations. Um, as the farmer market, then that's when it is at a fixed location. But Whitney, please, if you have any additional information or clarification, please, please help me out. Yeah, no, you nailed it. Um, for direct marketing farmers, they do have the unique ability to accept SNAP anywhere they sell. So uh, you're not tied to your physical location. Um, and they do that just because they know farmers are, you know, on the move when they're selling. So you wouldn't need a different SNAP permit for each location. Thank you. I kind of I had a follow up question for that too. Can you be eligible to be a SNAP market and a SNAP farmer producer? Yes, yeah. Sense? You mean as could the same person apply for their farm business and then maybe they, uh, you know, manage a farmer's market? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah, you would have two separate permits for that and need separate equipment though. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just one more question that we kind of wrote down before, what are the potential reasons not to be um, approved? Whitney, do you have do you want me to jump in? Probably, yeah, you probably have more information on that. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I, and I'll share this in my presentation too, but the, the big, the most important thing is that a business meets the USDA stocking requirements. Um, and I'll go over those, but it's basically that your business is offering enough staple foods to snap customers. Um, so you need to meet those stocking requirements. That's very important to get approved. Um, and then as far as hangups in the SNAP application process, a lot of times it, it's the documents that give, give people trouble. The USDA is very particular about uh, the documents that you upload. Um, and if they if it's not exactly what they ask for, then they're going to ask you to re-upload it. And that can just make the whole process go a lot longer. Um, and some people kind of throw up their hands because it can be frustrating if you get a back and forth going. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. We have a question from Laura. Um, do you want to go in and unmute yourself, Laura, and ask that question? Yes, if you're a person accepting the SNAP benefit to your farm market manager, how does the, or the money get transferred to the individual vendors within the farmer's market? Good question. So yeah, that if it's the farmer's market that's managing a SNAP program, um, that equipment is tied to a, a bank account used for the market. And then the market will have to reimburse vendors. And some markets keep cash on hand to just you know, pay them out at the end of the market, but it's more common that they will write a check later or transfer the money you know, between bank accounts. Thank you. You're welcome. We have one more question in our chat. No, not from Denise. Uh, if I'm Sorry. able to accept I, I think, Denise, it's a really good question. Sorry, I was trying to type this into the chat. Denise, I think it's a really good question, and I kind of want to wait until after Lonnie presents because there could be some potential answers to, to a preference of, of whether you use your farmer's market SNAP or your own SNAP, um, if that's okay. okay. But let's hold that's on to it. That's perfectly fine. I just Great. wanted to make sure I got it out there. So if it's not answered in the questions, we'll hold on to it for the end. Thank you. Teamwork, y'all. Teamwork. I love it. I love it. Um, I just want to remind, I didn't talk about it this in the beginning. Please introduce yourselves in the chat with your preferred pronouns and the name of your farm or organization. Um, and I think now we're going to hand it over to Whitney. So if you want to start sharing your screen. Okay, thank you. Get my presentation up here. Okay. I'll get my notes up. Okay, we see in my presentation. Okay, good deal. All right, so um, you know this already, but hi everyone. I'm Whitney. Um, I I'm live in Colorado. I worked with the Denver Botanic Gardens for many years in uh, greenhouse production. Uh, but today, the hat I'm wearing is that of a regional representative with the MarketLink grant program. Um, so this is a grant opportunity that can help your farm or farmer's market accept SNAP. Let's jump in. Okay, so uh, what is MarketLink? It's a program that was created by the nonprofit, the National Association of Farmers Market Nutrition Programs, or the NAFMNP. And uh, MarketLink was first created in 2013 in response to a USDA grant opportunity known as the SNAP Equipment Grant for Farmers and Farmers Markets. Um, and since then, we've helped over 3,000 farmers and farmers markets accept over $69 million in SNAP sales. Um, and in a nutshell, what we provide for this SNAP Equipment Grant is uh, free technical assistance on the SNAP retailer application, uh, which Sarah uh, went over and it's a required step for any business that would like to be able to accept SNAP cards. Um, and then the grant pays for one year of SNAP card reader equipment for farmers and farmers markets. Um, so this grant is funded by the Farm Bill. So it's currently funded through September of this year. So it's a great opportunity to, to take advantage of it. 
So this SNAP equipment grant is made possible by a few key partnerships. Uh, so the founding organization, the NAFMNP, is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that helps the farmer's market nutrition programs succeed on the ground. So that includes WIC and seniors voucher programs. Um, and then we have a cooperative agreement with the USDA, or more specifically, Food and Nutrition Services, uh, which is the agency responsible for administering SNAP. So FNS is actually providing the funding for this grant. Um, and then we're partnered with Novodia Group, um, which is the company that actually is providing the SNAP card reader equipment, uh, which is an app called Total Pay Go. And I'll tell you all about that here in a bit. Okay, so here's a little more information on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, who's eligible to receive SNAP benefits? People qualify based on income and household factors. Um, and in Colorado, the majority are low-income working families or their families with elderly or disabled uh, household members. And just to give you an idea, in 2021, there were 41 and a half million Americans on the SNAP program. And uh, in Colorado, a little over 540,000 residents. And that's about 9% of our population. Um, and on average in Colorado, um, folks receive a little less than $6 per household member per day through SNAP. Um, and then Sarah went over the food, so we'll keep cruising along. Uh, so this is just showing you some of the, the wonderful benefits to our communities when local businesses and farmers markets uh, accept SNAP cards. Um, starting with the obvious in red, uh, when a farm accepts SNAP, they're expanding their customer base. Um, but more importantly, they're also improving food access to our community's most vulnerable population. And then by accepting SNAP, farms are demonstrating that everyone is welcome to shop with them and they're empowering SNAP customers to support our local economies. And this all helps build a sense of community. And now, of course, when SNAP customers have access to fresh, local, nutritious food, that's adding to their overall well-being. And uh, this also provides unique op uh, marketing opportunities to help promote your farm or farmer's market, uh, which hopefully means increased sales for your farm or market. And that will hopefully empower you to continue expanding your customer base. Uh, so hopefully this shows you kind of the positive feedback cycle that's created uh, when you're accepting SNAP at your, your farm or market. Okay, and then we talked about this a little bit, but it can't hurt to go over it again because it's a lot of information. Uh, so when and where can you accept SNAP cards? So typically most businesses are limited to accepting SNAP at their physical location during their business hours. Uh, however, uh, the USDA gives farmers more flexibility, so if you meet their definition of a direct marketing farmer, an individual producer of agricultural goods selling directly to the public, uh, then you have the unique ability to accept SNAP wherever you sell. So this includes farmers markets, uh, farm stands, or if you have a store, either on or off of the farm. And then you can also be accepting SNAP for CSA shares. I'll explain that more in the next slide. Um, and then you can also be accepting SNAP cards at multiple locations at the same time. You just need equipment for each location. Uh, so a lot of farmers want to know if they can accept SNAP for CSA shares. There's a few obstacles, but it is possible and many farms do it successfully. Uh, so SNAP regulation states that SNAP funds can't be used for products that are delivered in the future. Um, however, they have an exception for direct marketing farmers and nonprofit food buying cooperatives. Uh, they allow those business types to accept SNAP for items that will be delivered within two weeks of purchase. So the obstacle here is that a SNAP customer cannot pay for their full share up front. Um, there's another regulation that comes in into the picture, and that one is that a, um, SNAP cards must be charged in person. 
And this has to do with that pin code that a SNAP customer must punch in themselves to complete their SNAP sale. Um, so the obstacle here is that SNAP sales can't be completed over the phone. Uh, but farmers being the problem solvers you are, uh, the solution that a, a lot of farms use is that uh, they'll have SNAP customers pay for their share every two weeks at time of pickup. It doesn't have to be every two weeks, just that's the maximum. Um, now, sometimes farms will have a SNAP customer also provide a credit card to kind of hold their order as a backup. I've also seen farms ask a SNAP customer to sign an agreement to this arrangement. Um, so it takes a little extra effort, but it can absolutely be done. Okay, so how are SNAP cards uh, accepted at farmers markets? There's basically two systems out there that you might encounter. Uh, so let's first look at the vendor level system. So if you as a vendor at a farmer's market want to accept SNAP, but the organization running the farmer's market is either unable or unwilling to manage a SNAP program for the whole market, then it's going to be left up to the individual vendors to get authorized to accept SNAP. So in this system, uh, any vendor that wants to accept SNAP is going to need to do that SNAP retailer application. And then once they're approved, they'll need to get their own SNAP point of sale equipment. That equipment will be connected directly to the vendor's bank account. Um, and it's important to note that you can only accept SNAP for the items you're selling. Um, this is a fairly common scenario, especially with small or volunteer run farmers markets. Uh, it's not necessarily ideal because it's more expensive for the vendors. And also for SNAP customers, it can be confusing which booths accept SNAP. Um, so if this is your situation, you should you know, set aside a budget for signage to make it clear that you accept SNAP at your booth. Um, and then there's also the market level system. So in this scenario, uh, the organization running the farmer's market is going to do that SNAP retailer application. And then once they're approved, they will get one set of SNAP point of sale equipment that's used for the entire market. And then that equipment will be connected to a bank account that's used for the market. And all SNAP payments will go into that bank account and then vendors are reimbursed later. So to manage this, markets will use either tokens or script and I'll cover how that works in the next slide. Uh, but as you can imagine, this takes some resources on the farmer's market. Uh, they're going to need staff or volunteers to run the SNAP equipment, manage that token or script system, and reimburse vendors. And the market is also going to need a budget to cover those equipment costs, pay for the tokens or script, and then do vendor training and marketing and outreach. Um, but this is usually the ideal scenario because it takes the cost off the shoulders of the vendors and it's easier for SNAP customers because they know they can use their card on any eligible items in the market. Okay, so in that last scenario where the market has the SNAP equipment, uh, you're going to see them using tokens or script to manage SNAP sales. And script means some type of market currency representing those SNAP dollars. So you might, the top picture here, you might have seen these SNAP coupons um, that are provided by the Colorado Farmers Market Association. That's an example of script. So how this works is um, that SNAP card reader equipment is kept at an information booth on, at the market that's being operated by market staff or volunteers. Um, and a SNAP customer will be directed to go to that booth. And when they're there, they ask market staff to charge a certain amount to their card. Um, and then the market staff will give them tokens or the SNAP coupons in exchange. So then the customer is free to shop throughout the market and use the, the SNAP currency on SNAP eligible items throughout the market. So vendors will need to know what items they can accept that SNAP currency for. And then at the end of the market, the vendors will go to that information booth and turn in the SNAP currency spent with them to the market staff. Uh, market staff will record how much is owed to each vendor. And then as we were talking about, um, some markets keep cash on hand to just reimburse 
uh, vendors at the spot, but more commonly uh, later, the market will cut a check or will transfer the money electronically. Um, but farmers markets that are running this kind of system, they're required to train vendors on how it works. So they'll make sure that you're comfortable with whatever setup they have at the market. Okay, so if you wanna accept SNAP uh, for your farm or your farmer's market, how do you do that? Um, first big step is that SNAP retailer application. And um, as I mentioned, one of the most important requirements is to make sure that your farm or farmer's market can meet the staple food stocking requirements. And like I said, these are just to make sure that you're offering enough staple foods for SNAP customers. Um, so there's two criteria in here. You just have to meet one. And the language is a little wonky. There's a more detailed explanation on the USDA's website. And we at MarketLink can help you understand this. Um, but you need to meet either criterion A, which is having three stocking units of three different varieties of each of the staple food categories. And you can see the staple food categories here. Um, or you can meet criterion B. And that's that at least 50% of your sales are from the sale of staple foods. So for the most part with farmers and farmers markets, criterion B is how they're, you're eligible. Um, so if you can meet those requirements, then you know, your next step is gonna do that, is going to be to do the, the SNAP retailer application. And then once you're approved, you'll need you know, SNAP card reader equipment to process those cards. So let's look at how the MarketLink grant program can help you. Uh, the very first step with our grant program is to fill out the eligibility assessment on our website. Uh, so who is eligible? Uh, direct marketing farmers um, that meet that USDA definition. And it is important uh, to be a direct marketing farmer. At least 50% of what you sell, you have to have produced yourself. Um, also eligible are farmers markets meeting that definition. So who's not eligible? Uh, direct marketing or businesses that aren't direct marketing farmers or farmers markets. Um, or if you are one of those, but you've already received equipments from us since October 2019. So you can only use this uh, grant once. And also, if you have uh, functioning equipment that you receive through a state sponsored program. So you can't be double dipping in this, the state program and the market link grant program. Okay, so that next step is going to be doing the USDA SNAP retailer application. So once you submit the market link uh, grant application, we'll send you an email with the describing this next step. And in that email, there will be our step-by-step -step guide if you'd like to do the application on your own. Uh, however, we can submit the application on your behalf. And we highly recommend this option because it allows us to make sure you're eligible and then we can track your application. And this usually helps you get approved as quickly as possible. Um, and Sarah went over a lot of this, um, so I won't go, dwell too long, but it's, it, it's a lot of information, so it can't hurt to hear it twice. Um, so first of all, it is an online application. So if you have us apply on your behalf, we'll just send you the list of information to put together. And then you book a phone call with us. And during that phone call, uh, we will fill out the application for you. Uh, but if you do it on your own, you'll need to create an account on the USDA's website, then you can fill out the application. Uh, number two is figuring out who's gonna be the responsible official. Uh, for farms, this is pretty straightforward. They're gonna want all business owners. Um, for farmers markets, it depends on how or if it's, you know, legally organized. So we can help you figure out who's the right person. Um, third, uh, once you fill out the online application, there's the required documents that the USDA will want you to upload to their website. Um, in general, each responsible official needs to provide their photo ID and a copy of their social security card. Uh, the only exemption for the social security card requirement is for 501c3 nonprofit farmers markets or government owned farmers markets. Um, and if you don't know where your social security card is, there are a few alternatives you can use. Um, and then we talked about signature page, if you have any business licenses, 
And then if you are a 501c3, they're going to want your IRS determination letter. So number four, once they get those documents, that's when the USDA actually starts reviewing your application. Um, and during that time, they sometimes ask for additional information um, and there's a deadline to respond. So it's super important that you keep a close eye on your email and your mailbox, including your spam folder, um, because if you miss their deadline, then you'll they will withdraw your application. You'll have to start over from the beginning. Um, and number five, it's also important to, to keep an eye on the status of your application. You can do that at, online and by calling the USDA. If you have us submit your application, then we'll take care of that for you. And finally, once you're approved, you will be issued your SNAP permit. And on that permit is your FNS number, Food and Nutrition Services number, uh, which is necessary for getting your equipment. And as Sarah said, the takeaway story here is to start early. The whole process can take between one and three months. So this is a great time to be thinking about this. Um, Sarah went over this really well as far as maintaining your SNAP permit. I encourage you to yeah take this to heart because once you have it, you want to make sure you take care of your SNAP permit. Okay, so then your next step here is going to be to weigh out your different equipment options. Um, there's a lot of options out there and you should do your research to find out what's going to work right for you. Um, I would encourage you to first talk to Sarah and find out about what the availability of state funded equipment is. Um, and then you're welcome to reach out to MarketLink to learn more about our equipment. Here's kind of an overview of what the MarketLink grant provides. Uh, so we call this a bring your own device program, meaning that you'll need to have a smartphone or a tablet to run that Total Pay Go app on. And this can be someone's personal or business device. It just needs to have Bluetooth because that's how your, your card reader is going to connect to your phone or tablet. And then to run the app, you will need to have either a data plan or connection to Wi-Fi. Um, and this photo on the right gives you an idea of your, your setup in general. You're going to receive that little black box. That's the actual SNAP card reader. Okay, and then you may have noticed our equipment setup does not include a printer. Um, it's federally mandated that a printed receipt must be provided for SNAP sales. However, the USDA provides what they call a printed receipt waiver for those who receive equipment through MarketLink. So if you get equipment through this grant, then the Total Pay Go app is going to give the customer an option for a text or email receipt. Um, and you may know many SNAP customers depend on those receipts to track their SNAP account balance. Um, and the Total Pay Go app does have a balance inquiry option. So you can uh, check their balance and then text or email that to them um, as well. Uh, but if you do want or need a printer, those are available for purchase. Okay, if that equipment setup sounds like it would work well for you, then you're on to the last step in our grant program, which is signing up for a Total Pay Go account. Uh, some of the perks of Total Pay Go is uh, there's the ability to have a monthly or yearly subscription. The monthly, you can just turn on for the months you need. There's no long-term contract. You can cancel at any time without a fee. Um, there's no per transaction fees for SNAP sales, and then no setup fees or ACH banking fees. So here's what's covered by the grant for one year, and then what costs to expect after that first year. Uh, the grant covers the cost of the SNAP card reader entirely. That's yours to keep. And the grant pays for a one-year subscription to the Total Pay Go app. And then you have that printer waiver, so no costs for printing receipts. And then after the first year, if you want to keep using Total Pay Go, the cost is in the subscription to the app. So that's $191.40 per year or $19.95 per month. Um, and this slide gets into the per transaction fees. As I said, with uh, Total Pay Go, there's no per transaction fees for SNAP sales. 
um, but total pay is partnered with both Square and World Pay to give you the option of also accepting credit and debit cards through the Total Pay Go app. So with that partnership, you would integrate your Square World Pay account into the Total Pay Go app. And then the per transaction fees are set by those companies. So Square is charging 10 cents plus 2.6% of the sale, and they don't require a contract. World Pay charges 15 cents plus 1.79% of the sale, and they do require a multi-year contract. Uh, but one important difference is that if you go with Square, you will need to get the Square card reader for credit and debit cards. And that will connect to the Total Pay Go app at the same time as the Snap card reader. So you'll be using one app, Total Pay Go, but you have two card readers depending on the type of, of card you're processing. That's one perk to World Pay. You can use the same card reader for everything. Okay, and this just shows you what the Total Pay Go app will look like on your smart device. That far left screen is your sign in screen. And then the second one is your home screen that shows all of your different tender types. What shows up on your app will just depend on what you're set up with. Usually it's just snap and credit. And then in addition to the app, you have the website and that's where you sign in and you can view and download all of your sales data. And you can also put your sales data into different handy displays if you like to visualize things. And so that wraps it up for the SNAP Equipment Grant. Um, we do have one other grant that's kind of exciting and might be relevant to you, uh, which is the online SNAP purchasing pilot. Uh, so you might know it's been very difficult, impossible for small retailers to accept SNAP through their online store uh, because the USDA has very strict security standards that are expensive to, to create. Uh, the USDA recognized this problem for farmers, um, and so they developed a grant opportunity um, to find a solution, which the MarketLink team won. So we're in the final testing phases with our e-commerce partner, Grown By, and we'll be onboarding farmers once we get the green light from the USDA. So if you're interested, let us know, and we'll have you sign up for our newsletter so you can uh, be the first to know when this grant becomes available. Uh, but no matter what, your first step will be to get uh, become a SNAP authorized retailer. So that's a good place to start. Okay, thank you all so much for your time. I know that was a lot of information. Um, so I'm happy to take questions now or, or reach out to me later. Thank you so much, Whitney. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, please raise your hand. I'll try to check it out. Um, and if not, I think the other great thing about all our presenters is they're making themselves available if we have any further questions that we can email them and, and send those out to the collective too, because this is all about learning. So I don't see anybody raising their hand right now. Josh, I had my hand up. Sorry. Oh, I had, my bad. I, I didn't have see a, it. I apologize. Question. Um, so uh, this could be a mixed question for Whitney and Sarah, but um, on the East Coast with a farm out there, what we had done to accept SNAP was, um, and this was a couple years ago, so it might be outdated, but we post dated um, paper vouchers for the entire summer and then would process the paper vouchers. I don't know how the, the paper vouchers are, are necessarily processed through these systems or if you can process through these systems, but I'm I'm not sure if that is a valid way of processing SNAP. So it, it was a way to, to take CSA essentially. So I wanted to ask, are you able to post date paper vouchers and do they work with these systems? Yeah, I've never heard of that approach before. I don't know of any reason why you couldn't do it that way. I, I don't know if Sarah knows of any regulation that states otherwise, but I certainly don't. Um, so, yeah, I too have never heard of this. Um, I don't know how legit it actually is, to be quite honest with you. Um, it does kind of sound like a workaround. It may have worked. Um, but honestly, like, 
it's probably like that like asking a customer to like sign that like dated in the future is probably not the like correct way or the intention of the manual voucher so unfortunately um i do know from with the manual voucher that you call to get an authorization and there's an authorization code. So my concern would be that you've got a voucher today that you're having somebody sign for in the future, but the authorization code would need to be received in the future. And you can't guarantee that that customer is going to be receiving SNAP and have a balance. And once you get the authorization code, you only have 15 days clear the voucher. So there is a lot of risk in running it that way and probably something that I totally would not recommend and likely may not get paid um, at the end of the day if the customer is no longer getting SNAP or they have to use you know, their SNAP benefits because you still need to get that authorization number. And I think from the date you get the authorization number and funds are available, like the, there's a hold like place on the account to hold the money, and then you have 15 days from that to actually clear the voucher. So, yeah, I I would not probably recommend that practice. Hopefully, that answers your question or yeah. gives you a little bit more insight. And is the the authorization number used through like the the Total Pay app, or is it? Um... Yes. Yeah. With the total pay app, you, when you, you know, got back to service or, or whatever's causing you to need to use the, the manual voucher, then you would, you need to plug in the authorization number to complete the sale. Okay. Thank you. Authorization number replaces running the card and putting in the pin. So basically when you're doing that paper voucher, you're calling the EBT your processor to say, is there, you know, $20 available, $50 available on this EBT account and SNAP benefits? And if yes, then that authorization code places a hold and pulls that balance so the client can't use that money. And the authorization code, code like holds that money for 15 days to allow for your at a later time and then get paid. But if you don't have that authorization number or the funds aren't available, when you call and get that authorization number, you're not gonna get paid. And if you already gave the product like a month ago or a week ago or days ago, like you're just not gonna get paid for them. So there's definitely a lot of risk. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for sharing your expertise. I think we have one more question. I'm living good. Let's hear it. Hi. Yeah, hello there. Um, I, I'm not sure if my question is tying in with what you guys are talking about or not, but um, I'm actually part of uh, eight farmers markets um, during the summer, but there's like a couple locations that don't uh, accept EBT, so that's why we're applying. Um, but most of the markets take some kind of token uh, mentality where they take the funds from somebody EBT and they give them tokens where they can redeem later. Um, is this different than a paper voucher where someone who was wanting a CSA or something could just buy, you know, a hundred or two hundred dollars with a token and they could just bring the tokens back in whenever they were to pick up their CSA? Mm. Those are that would be two separate things. Yeah, the tokens are are really just to manage sales at the at the farmers market. And manual vouchers are generally used as a backup, like if the equipment's not working or there's some kind of, you know, natural disaster. Um, that's that's really the intention of manual vouchers. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Uh huh. Angie, go on and ask your question when you're when when you feel comfortable. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is about the USDA stocking requirement um, for our small organization who we, of course, during the growing season, that's when we have our availability. Does that USDA stocking requirement will only pertain for when you're actively um, having your market stand up versus year round? That's a great question. Yes, because when you read it, it's going to sound like you need to be having this an inventory of this on con on a constant basis, um, but that doesn't apply to farmers and farmers markets. Um, they they understand that farmers markets the, it, the your inventory really fluctuates through the year. So 
Um, it, that's more important for like a retail store. They expect you to have that, you know, every day in your business hours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing anybody else with any more questions, but please put them in the chat if you have them and we will make sure that uh, our incredible presenters get that question. Hopefully we can get those answered. And I think we're going on to Lonnie now. Hey y'all, um, I'm Lonnie Bird. I'm the Double Up Food Bucks Manager. Um, thank y'all um, for being here and thank you to Frontline for putting this together. Um, so I am who you wanna see after you are approved for SNAP um, and you have your equipment. So um, I work for Nourish Colorado um, and our mission is um, that we are change makers who strengthen connections with and between farms, ranches and communities so that all Coloradans have equitable access to fresh, nutritious foods. We achieve our mission by engaging in policy advocacy for systemic change, managing innovative programs, and developing community partnerships and grassroots networks to rebalance the food system and create healthy food environments. So, um, the reason I'm here, Double Up Food Bucks, um, Three of the great things that Double Up Food Bucks does is it helps um, families bring home healthy food. Um, it helps farmers to increase sales and farm profits and more food dollars stay in local economy to help strengthen um, communities. So what is Double Up Food Bucks? So um, Double Up Food Bucks is a um, nutrition incentive program. So it is a, um, a SNAP um, incentive program. So you must have SNAP and um, a person would, we, a person would, sorry, use their SNAP card um, at a participating double up vendor. And we would do a one-to-one -one match up to $20 per day, $20 max per day. So it is to incentivize local fruit and vegetable purchases, and it is a produce program. So um, you must sell produce in order to um, participate in the Double Up um, program. Um, there, are very, there are many um, outlets where Double Up exists. Um, in farmers markets, in grocery stores, um, in direct marketing farmers, and um, some alternative food retailers. Uh, Double Up is made possible through the um, Gus Shoemaker Nutrition Incentive Program grant. Um, it is part of the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, which gave $250 million over five years for um, nutrition incentive programs. Um, it is a competitive grant program. So um, Double Up um, started in 2009 in Michigan with um, um, an organization called Fair Food Network. Um, and it is a nationwide program. So Fair Food Network is still like the, they still are the, um, uh, the main double up partner. And we all um, basically contract under them through this competitive grant. So um, Nourish is, runs double up for the state of Colorado only. Um, so this is a fruit and vegetable incentive, as I um, mentioned earlier, for SNAP participants. And it is in all types of retail that accept SNAP. Um, and it requires a one-to-one -one match, meaning that if we request, if Nourish um, requests in our grant um, a $1.5 million um, grant, then um, the USDA, which 
which is over this grant, um, requires us to raise the $1.5 million too. So we would be asking them for $1.5 million. And then we also would have to come up with a $1.5 million match um, through either through private funding or other um, um, funding or um, in-kind donations. So this is a snapshot of the Double Up Food Bucks national program um, in 2020. Um, it was in 28 states. Um, now it's in 29 states. Um, and Double Up, and there are other um, double like programs that are like um, produce match uh, pro programs that are not necessarily under the double up umbrella, but under the double up um, umbrella, there are 28 states nationwide. And so these are the national numbers um, as of 2019. Sorry, this, this is the, the most recent update that we have. But um, as you can see, back then, and all of these numbers have increased since then. Um, it was in 928 sites across the um, country um, in 28 states, and I know it's in 29 states now. Um, and then you guys can see the people um, impacted 221,000 plus families, 430, 443, thousand individuals and 4,863 farmers. Um, and then the SNAP and double up spent in farmers markets. Um, you all can see this this graphic here. Uh, you'll you'll be sent this graphic. So just give to give you an idea of like how big um, the program is and how big the impact is. Um, and just for a double up 2022 um, snapshot of Colorado. Um, we were in 26 counties last year and 85 sites. Um, so that means um, varying sites. We have some, um, of course, farmers markets and farms and um, CSA shares. And we have some um, small grocery stores, some bodegas, and we have some um, like middle sized grocers too. Um, so 70, 70 of our 85 sites are um, strictly dedicated to Colorado growers, meaning that it's farmers markets, farm stands, um, CSA, and direct farm sites. Um, and um, the other 15 were in grocers. And grocers, um, there is a requirement if you are um, if you are not a grocer that the produce that is um, that is um, redeemed with double up be Colorado grown. Um, and last year we um, over a million dollars of double up food bucks was redeemed. So that means that people used over a million dollars um, of double up to purchase uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. And so how double up works at farmers markets. Um, sorry, this says tokens, but it's actually vouchers. So um, a customer would go to the market booth and they would swipe at the market um, info booth or farm stand, and they would earn their one for one um, incentive match and double up vouchers of up to $20 a day. So um, for instance, they would go to the, the um, stand, swipe their card for $20, they will receive $20 in SNAP um, market bucks or whatever way that that market or your farm decides to, to distribute the SNAP incentive, the SNAP, and then you would match it with $20 of double up um, vouchers. And um, the vouchers are redeemable um, immediately. Um, for locally grown um, produce in the market, or they can be redeemed um, at a later time. So um, one of the questions that Casey had brought up um, just with um, Whitney about um, like kind of holding on to SNAP vouchers um, to use at a later date for CSA shares. Um, one workaround if you have double up is that if you, um, if someone was to, um, 
buy purchase a CSA share with their SNAP card. And this particular vendor also does um, double up. What they could do is if it's a $50 box, they could run the $50 on their SNAP card and that will pay for that box. And then they give them $50 in double up because there is a, a caveat to double up. If it's a CSA share, um, you can't do more than the $20 per day. So um, they would give them the $50 and double up vouchers, and then they could redeem that at a later time. They can save that for later on in the season if they choose to. Sorry, I hope I didn't confuse anybody. <laughs> And then, um, so what items can be purchased with Double Up at um, um, farm sites, farmers markets, through CSAs? Um, it's going to be everything you see on the right-hand side. So um, Colorado-grown fruits and veggies, Colorado-grown dried beans, um, fresh herbs, and food-producing plants and seeds. Um, so you cannot buy um, like added value things. You can't um, buy like honeys, jams, jellies, any canned, anything, anything that's been processed. And of course, not hot prepared foods. You can't buy that with Snap either. Um, and then how it works at a grocery store, which doesn't apply to anybody here, but just if you want to know um, how Double Up works at a grocery store is it does not have to be Colorado grown um, produce. And um, it would work with a, a loyalty um, card or program. Um, um, Whitney talked about Total Pay Go, and they do have a loyalty program that we use in stores where people sign up and they would put in their whatever 10 digit number that they desire to use for um, double up. And when they run their snap card, um, every all the all the um, the um, double up goes into their loyalty account and then they just redeem their double up by using by inputting their um phone number or whatever 10 digit number they decide to use for their loyalty um and then um also, we have a coupon um, method so um we are in a few save a lot stores in the um throughout Colorado and what how it works there is when um, someone buy when someone uses their snap card um, the POS system automatically basically prints out a coupon that will have their double up on it that they could use um, not for that transaction but they can use it for a later transaction and so how um, double up support you like how the program um, supports you of course we will provide you with all of the training that you would need um, to become a once you become a double up um, vendor and technical assistance including we do have a partnership with um, total pay um, just like um, market link so um, we could we could help you with that um, you do have um, site visits from myself or somebody else in um, Double Up staff. We do have an outreach and community engagement support um, team. So we have a community outreach and community um, engagement um, manager. And then we have um, several um, what we call um, community food navigators, which are basically um, liaisons between um, community and us that really get the word out about Double Up um, in their communities. Um, of course, marketing materials, um, everything that's branded Double Up to, you know, make sure that people know that you welcome Double Up um, in your markets. Um, um, you have access to a partner network, which um, this year we're doing something different where we are um, creating an online space for all of our Double Up partners to um, commune with each other so that you can share like best practices and things like that. Um, um, social media, we do have... Um, both Double Up um, Colorado social media and Nourish so social media, and we do cross promote um, that. Um, and then um, 
also you would be on our our um, Double Up Colorado website. And then we do have a Double Up um, hotline. Sorry, y'all, it's a long day. The words, they're getting harder. <laughs> um, and then Double Up Food Bugs, how it helps your consumers. Um, shoppers say that um, they eat more fruits and veggies because of Double Up, of course. Um, Double Up shoppers say they try different veg veggies and fruits. And then also Double Up shoppers say that they ate fewer things like chips, candies, cookies as a result of the program. Um, and Double Up helps local um, farmers um, Farmers said, have said that um, they made more and combined SNAP and Double Up sales because um, Double Up is like the icing on the cake. You know, um, it's great to offer SNAP, but it's even better to offer SNAP and Double Up because, you know, people are getting more um, bang for their um, SNAP. Um, we had 110 farmers that participated in um, Double Up. Um, through farmers markets um, in the state of Colorado in 2022. Um, farmers report uh, making more money as a result of Double Up. And um, farmers report that they will expand acreage, diversify crops, and purchase new equipment because of Double Up. Oops, wrong way. Um, and how you can become a Double Up partner. So we are actually, um, we just had our application season and we are, um, we have made decisions. We're getting ready to send the decisions out now. So um, unfortunately for 2023, we have, um, we're done accepting partners for this year. Um, however, um, we will open up applications again in January of 2024, and um, you can email your interests to that email address, partners at nourishcolorado.org, or you can sign up for our newsletter at um, nourishcolorado.org, um, and that, that really is the best um, way to really stay abreast of everything that Nourish has um, going on. And then... Me, there's my information. If you all need to contact me directly, um, there's my phone number, there's my email address. Um, I know that that was a lot or maybe not enough at all. So that was awesome. All the Lani. questions, y'all. That was awesome, Lani. I, we really appreciate you bringing your expertise. You've been doing this for a long time. So we very much appreciate you coming and giving us your two cents. I know Casey and I had written down a few questions. Um, one that I was interested in is where in Colorado are there very few or no double up food box vendors? I'm not sure if you would know that off the top of your head. Um, there's a lot. So we're, I think there's 64 counties in Colorado and we're, we're in 26. So there's quite a few. Mm -hmm. So a few. It, it's... Eastern Colorado, like really nothing in Eastern mm -hmm. Colorado, Northern Colorado, there's a lot of um, space um, where we're not. There's a um, big challenge to getting double up vendors in the ski communities too, because the store owners, even though traditionally uh, there are like a lot of people who need that food access in those communities. Um, store owners um, are frown against, um, uh, are not so happy about SNAP. They have a perception of who is going mm -hmm. to be participating in SNAP and stuff. So those are, those are our major places where we are not right now. Yeah, we've definitely talked about the stigma that's around SNAP and, and, it's it's difficult to fight it. Um, I wanted to go back to a question Denise uh, put in our chat earlier. If I'm able to accept SNAP as a direct to consumer farmer and my farmer's market also accepts SNAP, would there be a preference for me to accept it or to allow it to go through the farmer's market? And this could be a question for all our presenters, but I'm going to throw it to you first, Lonnie, if you have well, any thoughts on that. So, uh, so SNAP, um, is not my bag. It would be double up. So we'll just say that both of, we'll say that um, this person is asking for double up for both themselves and for their farmer's market. That is totally um, up to you and the market um, that you are at uh, in regards to double up. Um, 
I, I, I think it would probably be easiest for you to run it through the market. Um, unless you are somewhere where, unless you're at a market where they don't accept snap and double up. Um, I don't know what the benefit of, of you doing it yourself would be. Um, I see Whitney kind of perked up. So she, she looks like she may have a um, question and answer. Hold on. Let me stop sharing too. Yeah. So uh, I guess to jump in there on that question, um, well, my first re reaction or thought is that if you're going to a farmer's market where they're accepting SNAP, they probably won't want you to be accepting SNAP with your own equipment at your booth. Uh, they're going to want everybody to kind of be on the same program. So everybody doing their token or script system and not have, you know, kind of renegade booths with their own equipment just for, you know, more efficiency and doesn't confuse anyone. Um, and then as far as the benefits, I, I guess I I would was thinking, you know, if there's the double up opportunity for customers at the market, then, you know, it might um, benefit your customers more if they are, are accepting SNAP through the market as opposed through you. Um, and then one final thing to consider is just, you know, uh, you, as Sarah mentioned, you will receive a 1099K for all your SNAP income at the end of each year. Um, and so, you know, if you're participating in any kind of programs where, you know, that bump in your income could make you uneligible, then that might be a reason why uh, let the market take that, um, at, at that income onto their you know, taxes of the 1099K. So those, those are my thoughts on it. I, I hope that helps. Yeah, that, I mean, it gave me a little bit more to chew on, you know what I'm saying? Um, one last question we had was, how can Nourish support farmers who want to reach SNAP customers? Ooh, how can, you, how can Nourish support farmers that want, want to reach, reach SNAP customers? Yeah. Um, so really it, it would have to be through double up food bugs because we don't deal directly in SNAP We we deal mm -hmm. through double up food bucks, which is a SNAP incentive. So, um, I would say that if you became a double up partner, then, um, some of those things are all of those things that I shared with you, um, at the end of the slide about how we could support, um, through outreach and promotions and, you know, putting you on our website and social media and, um, all of those things. Um, unfortunately we don't have, we don't, provide direct support for SNAP only because we are um, a nutrition and since we are, we run a nutrition incentive program. That's awesome, Lonnie. I really appreciate you bringing all your energy. I love your energy. Every time I get to be in your presence, it's a good thing. So. Oh, um, thank you, Josh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go all the way back to that Dahlia campus. Um, <laughs> I did, I did want to add something though. Um, just about, um, I kind of saw something in the chat regarding like, um, not being able to accept certain items with double up mm -hmm. and, um, just to, to let y'all know. So 20, um, Nourish also does a lot of policy work in 2023. Um, if, if you remember in that slide, I said that the the um, this program is funded through the 2018 Farm Bill, which is now being worked on now, the 2023 Farm Bill, um, which probably won't go into effect until 2020. Well, definitely won't until 2024. But I say all that to say that um, we are um, really advocating to to have these um, some of these food food groups expanded. Um, I don't know about meat, honey and eggs, but um, I I am me personally, I am really advocating for grains um, being something that um, is accepted through um, um, double up and, um, frozen, um, fruits and veggies. Um, but, um, 
I, I say all this to say that um, this is the time to really get with your um, with, with your your politicians, <laughs> with your local politicians and tell them like, we want this to happen. We want to see this and you really like advocate for the things that you would love to see in this farm bill. Like it's really important right now. Um, and yeah, so that's it. Off my high horse. Bye-bye. Oh man, we love it. <laughs> get get on that soapbox. We need it. We need to hear that stuff. Um, so yeah, we are going to head into our last presenter for the evening. Casey Neese, who is the dad of activists and system managers with Frontline Farming. And then I'm going to say a few things about our SNAP program with Frontline as well. So Casey, please take it. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Um, first of all, I want everyone to kind of like stand up for a second if you are able and like stomp your feet and shake out your arms, move around. You can hear my earrings rattling against my headphones. It's been a long hour and a half. And I just want us all to kind of make it through this last 20 minutes together. So stretch your hands to the ceiling. Lean to your right. Lean to your left. All right, come back to center. Where it's only going to be 20 minutes left. I'm going to go through my section um, in our presentation. Uh, a lot of what we have um, planned has already been talked about. So um, if you're unfamiliar with frontline farming, we have three farms in the Denver area. We are a uh, BIPOC, a Black, Indigenous, People of Color, and women-led organization. We do work for food justice, food access, and food sovereignty along the Front Range. We have five urban farms in Denver, two in Denver and one in Arvada. And so we are across Denver County, Adams County, and Jeffco County. We'll send out more. I'm sure you're, you're mostly familiar with us, so you can check out the website for more. Um, as Whitney mentioned, uh, SNAP is actually a a way to access communities. It's a way to provide um, access and gain more customers. And so the way we approach SNAP customers at Frontline is we really think of this as not a charity, but potential sales. This is a way to market to larger uh, client bases. It can also be a pull factor for clients who are looking for places to spend their SNAP dollars. We often get people reaching out asking about um, if we accept SNAP and how that works with our CSA. And it also can help you leverage greater access to state and federal dollars and programs. All of this was covered in other people's presentations, so I won't spend too much time here. But as farmers, uh, the program, we, we want to encourage everyone to look at it as a market, not as a charity. This isn't something you do to get more grant money, although it can help you get more grant money. This is more about serving community and reaching customers. We, so EBT readers were talked about at Frontline. We did use MarketLink grant last year. It got us up and running in time for the season. We went through Total Pay Go and actually included the square reader, so that way we can take um, credit cards and uh, EBT cards together. And we have a tablet that just kind of goes with us from location to location. We also got, I think it was a T-Mobile hotspot, which is $15 a month when you turn it on. Um, and so hotspots are actually a lot more cheaper. It's a flat fee of 15. It was not, um, it's not by the data that you use. And so that was the choice that we went with. Um, okay, so this was kind of covered as well. Can't pre-charge for SNAP or your CSA. And so it is a little bit of difference. Um, we do know it's the 14 days, uh, within 14 days of pickup, which I think Whitney mentioned. Um, basically, and, and I think Sarah is the one who educated me on this last year, but um, SNAP is not credit. And so you cannot charge it as if it were a credit card. It has to be charged to pay directly for the items that you're getting. You can't charge it forward. 
uh, what Frontline does is within our CSA, we do the best to minimize the differentiation between our SNAP customers and our customers paying with credit cards. Um, and so that might look like having a different location to charge the card. So you're not um, running the card at pickup. A lot of times it'll have other customers ask, oh, do I need to run my card? Is, is there anything I need to do? And then it puts you in an awkward position of explaining, well, this person has, a, has an EBT card. And so separating those, those points are really helpful. Sometimes what I've done is actually walked back to the car with them and ran it at the car um, just to kind of maximize that dignity. Um, frontline, I should say, most of our sales are through CSA. We've done a couple like pop-up markets and stuff like that, but the majority of our sales are CSA, which is why I'm talking about this. Um, we're flexible with the sign-up process. The way I've set it up is if you go to the website, you sign up for, for a CSA, you check a box that says, I'm going to be paying with my SNAP. The customer will get a coupon then that discounts their CSA purchase down to $1. That way they can order what they want through the website without having that upfront charge, which we cannot legally do with SNAP. And so it, it helps them commit. They understand that they put a dollar down on the CSA and then we contact them later and have a personal relationship with the client to say, okay, here's what you're gonna be charged. Here's how our process works. Here's um, our partnership with Double Up Food Bucks means you're, this is your price every week. Um, the other thing I'll say is that your first wheel year will probably be pretty small. I think there was like six, like it was three or four, and then it was six and then 10, and now it's like 12 or 14. And so it does grow for us each year, but it, it is a smaller base when you first start. And so there is a need to advertise that you are taking this. Um, I get a lot of calls and contacts actually through the double up, where is it at app. Um, and so even if you, which is not great for folks who are, are doing meat, eggs, and honey and can't take double up, but to reach some SNAP customers, I know that people are looking at the double up um, page. Um, trying to be conscious of time. So the last big thing I'll share is just, I wanted to provide an example of how we charge SNAP and double up. So for example, um, I don't think this is our exact price this year for our share, but if a single share was $400 and we have a 16 week share, that breaks down to $25 a week. When you're matching dollar for dollar, what that means is that we charge $1,250 uh, on the SNAP card and I do a record keeping sheet of the other $1,250 for double up. In our system, we do a reimbursement process. So Double Up reimburses us halfway through the season and again at the end of the season. Um, you can get money up front, but then I think you have to return it if you don't use it all. And so we prefer the reimbursement system. And so you get half of the money when you charge the card and then you get uh, the other half of the money when Nourish processes reimbursements. Example two, let's say you have a huge share $752 a share, that's $47 a week. Now, if we look at that, if we split it directly in half, the double up is gonna be over $20. And so you cannot do a dollar for dollar match here. So this is the math that I've worked out for our season, right? If you do $20 a week, dollar for dollar match, that's 320 for the season. I take that, and subtract it from the total of the share. And then I divide out that remaining amount for the remaining 16 weeks, right? And so that's gonna be $20, $27 that I charged the SNAP card. And then I'm, I'm getting reimbursed from Nourish Colorado $20. And so that way there isn't any loss of funds. You know what your, your vegetables cost. You, you get all that money that you know you put into it, um, but it isn't exactly a 50-50 split. The other way to do it is just to kind of look here and say, all right, if I reduce this down to 20 and add that 350 back into the top amount, but there's different ways to kind of think through that math. If your share does exceed that $20 a week, um, 
we do our best to kind of maximize the benefit for our SNAP customers. Um, part of that, what that means is we are charging weekly in order to ensure we are getting, getting people that, that best double up price. You know, we could do that, that bi-weekly charge that um, Sarah and Whitney suggested, but however, um, it doesn't maximize double up for the customer. And so for us, this is the way we've chosen to do it. I think the next slide is you, Josh. So yeah, thank you so much for that, Casey. I think it's always important to kind of see how a lot of those logistics work out, you know, to make this work for you. And I think you and Fatima and everybody at Frontline's done a great job with that. So um, yeah, we I, I'm the food access manager, so I manage our amazing SNAP team. Um, you know, one of the things that we've noticed is Colorado has some of the lowest enrollment in SNAP in the nation. Um, that picture right there to the right is what the 2023 federal poverty line estimates are. And so if you make over 200% for a household of one, um, which is 2,266, you wouldn't be eligible, but you can see how quickly that can change as you go up in household size. And then for each additional member, which we have a lot of folks all living in the same house together, um, that's kind of what the gross income would be adding $788 for each person beyond eight um, to kind of figure out if you're eligible for SNAP. You know, one of the other things that we've realized is many of our most vulnerable communities are including farmers, but also students, immigrants um, qualify for SNAP. Um, and I think one of the things I just want to offer right now, if any of you are food insecure, if you want to check what your eligibility is, please reach out to me. We have three incredible SNAP coordinators that really know what they're doing and they make it as easy as possible. So we have great partners. We work with Kaizen, Commune, We Don't Waste, Metro Caring. Um, yeah, we have a lot of great partners that we work with to, to try and get SNAP to the people that we need it. I don't wanna to talk too much more because I know we're right there at time and I want if you have any more questions that you want to ask our amazing team while you have them, I will be sending out um, the recording of this. And once I get the okay from all our presenters, I'll be giving them, um, also sending the, their presentations that they've given us. Um, but please, if you have any more questions, now is the time. Um, and I want to say too, if you do have more questions that you can send those to us and we can forward those along to them and, and this is a community of knowledge sharing, so. I'm not seeing any more questions right now. Um, yep, it I looks like Isaac's got one. Oh, Isaac. Go on, Isaac. Yeah, um, my only question is, uh, I think somebody mentioned it before, but just promotional items like a banner or something that helps people to know that we accept PBC at our booth. So I know that you can order some of that stuff through Double Up Food Bucks. Um, if you are accepting Double Up Food Bucks, I I know there are places to get this, the We Accept Snap. Um, actually, Whitney, I see you off mute. Go ahead. Yes, that was, um, that was typical USDA We Accept Snap um, signs. You can request more copies of them and they'll send them to you for free. Uh, by calling the SNAP Retailer Service Center. I'll drop that phone number in the, the chat box here. Um, but yeah, you can get more that way. And then if you reach out, Market Link, we have a few um, kind of We Accept SNAP um, flyers that we share as well. Thank you so much, Whitney. Yeah. Any more questions before we wrap it up? not seeing anything. Casey, I just want to thank you for getting us to get up and kind of shake out the, the sits bones. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, we'll be sending out the recording soon and we'll also be sending out the presentation. So um, I hope you have a great evening and yeah, here's to a good season. Bye everyone. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Thank you everyone. We really appreciate you and hope to see you, you know, out in the fields and at the farms and the farmers markets this summer. <laughs>